Hi boys and girls, waves and strays of salted sports fans of John and Den's show. Den, I'm with the one and only Phil First, CEO of Horses for Sources or something like that, innit? Another ex, anyway, he's an expat, I'm an expat, so what's H happening? HFS Research. H okay, sorry. <laughs> HFS Research. You've been doing a lot of stuff over the last year, you're growing like crazy, what's going on, Phil? Yeah, yeah, we're just entering our third year of existence, we've been around for two years. Um, we started a research firm um, to focus purely on services and outsourcing around business processes mm. and technology. Mm. We felt there was a niche in the market to do that. Right. And I mean, so far, I think we've been pretty right. We right. have a business now of 47 staff worldwide. We have a team of analysts and experts who cover services and outsourcing. Um, we have a good uh, bench of people in the States, but also we're growing in Europe as well as Asia back. And they say the world of analysis is dead, right? <laughs> so, so what, come on, what makes your firm different? Because, I mean, you're known in your own world, I guess, to, right. to some extent. But, I mean, what makes it different? What is it you do that other people don't? Um, I, think, I think the first thing we did was we started the, the company on a foundation of social media. Right. So we already had a very big blog. Social following. media? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We had, a, we had a great blog following to start with. Right. So we had the blog of outsourcing industry, yeah. which we called Horses for Sources, which yeah. was based on the British expression, certain horses run better on certain courses. Yeah. And we took this catchphrase on that, and mm. the goofy name sort of took off. And when we launched the company, I think we had 16,000 subscribers to the blog already. Right. So our challenge was, how do we take our social media presence and translate that into a research brand? And make it scale as well. And make it scale. Yeah. And and you know, bring in people who can bring something different to the table. Mm. So what I think we've done that's made us successful is uh, a number of things. A, we haven't gone down the traditional analyst model of just hiring ivory tower types. So people who just pontificate, you know, talk in riddles about very high level trends and things like that. Who might you be thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we've done is we've hired a mixture of <coughs> practitioners. So yep. people who've come out of industry who've yeah. actually been it, yeah. done it. Yeah. Um, uh, endured it. Mm. So our head of research actually spent nine years at WellPoint right. running their BPO operations. Mm. And so he now has incredible experience that he can share across multiple, multiple buyers of outsourcing. Right. And he's becoming a brilliant analyst because he has this ability to learn from everybody else as well as his own experience. Do, do you mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you right. have to do it in order to be able to talk about it, right? Are you saying, what is it that, that he's able to learn and augment from his own experience. What, what makes that, that combination valuable? Um, I think he talks their language. Right, yeah. Um, and he helps our other analysts talk the language of the buyers better. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing we hear about from the clients is um, they, t they talk to us as if we can, they can have a beer with us. They actually feel like when we write to them, they're like we're almost sitting over a pint, mm. having a genuine conversation about the industry and right. the real issues. Right. Um, so I think we've built this trusted, loyal following based yeah. on the fact that we've got a reputation for being brutally honest. Uh, we don't follow the trends of just calling the, calling the hot issues and mm -hmm. going down that sort of path. Right. Uh, we don't do any type of paper play. We don't do a lot of white papers and things like that. Um, and we have this multifunctional team. So I said we've got people who come from the buy side, people who come from the sell side. Great to have people who work for vendors. Yeah. They bring a different perspective themselves sure. and they're very savvy with marketing and understanding the industry. And then we have people who've come from consulting backgrounds, including myself. Um, and I think that's a very important skill today when you're servicing the buyer. Mm. And then we also have a few traditional guys who've come from the likes of Forrester uh, and IDC and companies like that as well. So, so, but, so you're, not, you're not sort of drafting in the typical sort of uh, analyst profile of some sort of product manager or some sort of product marketing guy or something along those lines. You're looking for a good mixture so that you can get a good blend of, of personality and experience that's going to resonate then with, with the buying community. That's, that's, yeah. I, I think that's what I'm hearing. I think it's getting people with the voice, yeah. getting people with the confidence to really call the, yeah. call the trends how they are, yeah. um, you know, call a spade a spade, uh, unafraid to take the industry to, to task on things that we know are wrong. Yeah. And you know, I think we've, we've definitely got the reputation for being seen as that place to be. Yeah. And people want to be associated with us. And you do it in a fun way as well. I mean, the blog, right. the blog is always hilarious. I think. I, well, it's, it has a very serious point. But I always mm -hmm. enjoy reading it because it's a, you know, you guys find a way of being able to put things over. But, 
Well, I've always said if you can, if you've got some tough news to deliver, right? If you can do it with a bit of humour, yeah. it's amazing how much more you. Can oh, absolutely, away. absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's switch gears. You've talked right. about, you've talked to me about cloud BPO, and right. uh, this is definitely not a topic that that you hear outside of your walls, particularly. So, yeah. uh, what the heck's that about? Well, we really see cloud as democratizing outsourcing. We think it's going to really change the game. Do you mean democratize or commoditize? Democratize. Okay. Um, it's going to give the customer the choice. Right. And, um, you know, when we look at um, processes today, I think you've got two ends of the spectrum. Mm. So you've got processes at one of the end of the spectrum that are completely done manually. Mm. So it could be uh, revenue cycle management in healthcare, mm. for example, you know, taking faxes from doctors inputting data into intranets, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum where it's completely automated. So it could be, um, for example, making a banking payment to somebody mm -hmm. from one bank to the other, and you're paying large transactional fees yeah, to do tell that. me about it, yeah. And then yeah. there's no human interaction at all. It's two cloud-based yeah. systems interacting with each other. Yeah. And then you've got all the stuff in between, yeah. like life sciences, like insurance, like retail, merchandising, all these types of processes which require some element of automation mm. in technology mm. or in the cloud mm. and some element of manual intervention. Mm. And so the BPO providers are coming at this because they're trying to productize process. Right. So they're trying to take, well, we <coughs> think we've got the best system for managing trade, you know, trade settlements and banking mm. than anyone else. Right. And we think we, you know, we can s stick this on SmartStream or something like that, stick it in the cloud, process the transactions, Run it back for the clients. Yeah. So, so j just just so that we're clear on this one, right. this is just this is not just labour arbitrage by any stretch. This is something completely different, then, right? Um, it's the com it's it's the blend of labour arbitrage. Yeah. Labour arbitrage is low cost process. Sure. Yeah. Uh, with automation. Yeah. 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 So we were talking earlier about you know we've seen some big deals signed in the insurance sector lately, yeah. and the the BPO provider. Is taking on sometimes one to two thousand employees right. and rebadging them as part of the deal. Mm. And what they're going to try and do over time to make that deal profitable is they've got to reduce the number of employees that they've rebadged and have better automation mm. so they can eventually run the same processes mm. with maybe five or six hundred employees and not two thousand. So the key is how do you leverage BPO and cloud more effectively to reduce uh, manual intervention of process, get better automation and reduce ultimately the cost. Okay, so BPO is usually associated purely as a, as a, as a cost um, leveraging exercise, right? And uh, I hear what you're saying there, but to my mind, cloud, it, it does something else. Cloud provides an opportunity to rethink processes. Is, is there much of that going on or is that, is, that, is, is that just not in the thinking at the present time? Um, I think what it's bringing to the table is this changing mentality of how do you pay for the service. Okay. So believe it or not, paying for a so on pr piece of on-premise software isn't too different from signing a five-year BPO deal. No. You're tied to the deal, yeah. um, whether you've got increasing or decreasing volumes right. of transactions, you're stuck paying that license every year. Sure. Um, what's happening in the BPO business is as processes are getting more commoditized, mm. uh, for example, accounts payable, Mm. Now, most accounts payable deals can be priced by transaction mm. and priced on outcome, not priced on inputs, which is FDEs. Right. So the more the BPO business can take pricing away from this pricing by employee, mm. the more they can price it in a kind of cloud-like environment, mm. i.e. let's pay per transaction, mm. or let's even pay on the business outcomes. That could be something like, if you can improve our payments by 20 million a year, we'll give you a 10% cut of that sort of thing. Right. That's how cloud is helping change the game. So, so you're not just seeing um, what I was thinking about, which is cost leverage, but you're seeing the emergence of new business models around process, business process outsourcing, yeah. but only supportable through, through cloud architectures. Is that effectively where it's going? Yeah, the cloud's like a right. great enabler. It's the sure. business around the cloud which is really going to yeah. pull the, the ultimate dynamic here, but the right. cloud is like the enabler to make this much more accessible, scalable, easier to yeah. you know, price, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, top two things we're going to see in 2012, what do you reckon? Um, I think the mid-market, <coughs> that kind of... Um, Everybody's been banging on about that for years, Phil, come on, do better <laughs> than that, mate. <laughs> um, but we, we generally see the seeds of the future of outsourcing are happening in the middle market, right. where um, we've got data to show that 
in the middle market, companies are going through outsourcing initiatives mm. and going from A to C a lot faster. Mm. So they're taking initial state to an end state and getting there much quicker because they have to. Right. Because in the middle market, you've got to make your deals bigger to get the vendors to do yeah, it for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. In the high end, it's still very slow incremental change. So we find there's a saying in outsourcing called lift and shift, and it's taking your same mess and giving it to a provider to run for less. Right. And the problem there is you're essentially kicking the can down the road mm. and saying, you know, well, just move it out now. <coughs> it's not fundamentally changing yeah. anything. Well, say so 20% yeah. on labor, yeah. and then eventually we'll do some transformation. Right. And uh, the difference is if you're a CFO, mm. your boss isn't going to turn around in three years' time and say, gee, that was a great 20% you saved three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be what's next, what's next, what's next. Mm. And so we're definitely seeing a, a much more stronger uh, traction in demand for outsourcing the middle market. That's right. where it is. Right. Um, something else big we're seeing, um, I think we're seeing a change in the status quo in, in our industry. <coughs> like We're actually getting less consolidation going on amongst the provider side in, really? in outsourcing. Absolutely. It's becoming less and less attractive for service providers to buy each other. Wow. Quite the opposite of the Oracle model then, eh? It's the complete opposite because it's much more attractive for a service provider to find a big client and and take on a lot of their right. processes at a low cost model and use that to build the business out. Because buying each other, the market caps are way too high mm. um, and scale isn't the name of the game anymore. Uh, why are the market caps too high? Is that, is, that, is that a reflection of the amount of business that's available? I think it's a reflection on the business, it's a reflection on the growth of Indian based outsourcing in particular. Right. Right. Uh, it's a reflection on the fact that they haven't come down yet. They have to come down at some point. Okay. People have been talking about this for years. And mm. the only consolidation we saw in 2011 mm. uh, were two or three deals all under a billion dollars. Right. It hasn't been a So nothing substantial, nothing in, substantial. In, the world, in the world of outsourcing. And you know, at some point we may see an IBM take out a cognizant yeah, or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. but I really don't see it for a while. Well, okay, so. fair enough. But for but for HFS, what's gonna happen next year? How are you gonna grow it? What's gonna happen? <laughs> So you want me to give out my secret sauce? Of course, absolutely. What, absolutely. Else, what else are we doing this? <laughs> um, I think as we've grown our model, the core of the value we've provided is our ability to create communities yeah. and yeah. communicate with them, extract data from right. them, service right. them, and everything. So I think we want to build research models increasingly around the communities. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do more of our um, uh, you know, buy-side events where people can share and exchange best practice. Okay. Uh, we're going to try and bring our buyers together a yeah. lot more both virtually and also physically. Yeah. So I think we're probably going a bit more down the model yeah. typified by the corporate executive board mm. than anything you see from the likes of Forrester or Gartner and that sort of thing. I don't think I don't think you've got anything to worry about because I personally believe that that kind of model, once you've established it, is extremely difficult to replicate because you need that combination of right people with right content, with right delivery mechanisms, and you don't build that overnight. I don't think so anyway. Yeah, it, it's funny. When I look in the market now, I don't see any competitive threats coming no. from our obvious competitors. They're probably going to come from some smart kids in India or China who are going to figure it out somehow. But mm -hmm. I think right now we've got the best network in the industry for our industry. Uh, we seem to have their attention. Mm -hmm. Now we have to capitalize. Phil, best of luck to you, my friend. Good, good one. Cheers. Heard it first. <laughs>